So with that, uh, we're excited to move into um, our first segment today. Uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, welcome Zach Rogue into the conversation. Zach, thanks for, for joining us. I need you to turn on your camera and unmute yourself, please. There you are. All right. Sorry about that. This is, I a, a, you know, the, I love that Room Raider uh, Twitter feed. I don't know if you've seen that, where they they basically look at, at you know, they sort of rate people's backgrounds and oh. uh, based on composition and stuff. And you, that is a solid nine out of ten. That's a very good setup you've got there. You got some books. You got some, yeah. some plants. You got some just <laughs> depth there. It's good. I can take no credit. Um, this is I've been in the garage for months, and my wife actually she's been so busy. Um, trying to find places to operate where we are not attacked by our children. And she got this tiny little desk and put it, this is actually my bedroom. <laughs> it, it, I, if it was me doing it, it would have been a blank wall, but she has all this cool stuff, you know, so uh, I take no credit. <laughs> well, Zach, we're so happy you're with us. And, and uh, for those of you who have not had a chance to, to be uh, fans and appreciators of, of Zach and, his amazing band Rogue Wave. Um, Alex is is putting a couple of links into into the chat, and you can you can definitely check that out. And um, you know, tell us a little bit, Zach, about you know, start. Let's just start with the band. Just tell us a little bit about Rogue Wave. Tell us a little bit about you know some of your history. And what I'm always interested in is kind of as we you know kind of pre-COVID, what were things shaping up like as you were kind of heading into 2020? Yeah, well, if you want to talk band origins, it is kind of interesting because the band Rogue Wave was really born out of, you know, when we had a major economic downturn downturn uh, before, uh, you know, when the, the tech bubble kind of crashed in the Bay Area, I got laid off <laughs> and uh, suddenly found myself with nothing to do. So really the, the band was kind of born out of the ashes of that experience. And I just, you know, I, I flew to a, a New York with a one-way ticket to just kind of focus on on music because I was suddenly jobless and and I didn't expect um, <laughs> certainly at the time for a band to come out. I just wanted to record. I hadn't really made my own music really before. So, uh, you know, fast forward several months later after working on the record, I used Craigslist, you know, at the time to find band yeah. members. And, uh, and, and it really, that's really how I kind of started the band and we started from there. And I think we played, every venue in the Bay Area, just any gig we could take. And then we, we got extraordinarily lucky and got picked up by Sub Pop um, in Seattle. And that really kind of uh, was a shotgun blast and you know got our band going. Um, so it was an unexpected beginning, let's just say. <laughs> so I didn't expect to be in that position to be in a touring band or you know to really do anything outside of my bedroom <laughs> yep. with my guitar. Yep. So, you know, we've, we've you know, really enjoyed featuring, you know, recording artists, performing artists on our show as often as we can, just to kind of check in and like, how are you doing? You know, like, what, 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 what's the vibe at this point? How are you feeling? I know you've, you've taken to doing some online shows, like what yeah. kind of, where are, what's, what's your head at and your heart at kind of as we were into month 10 of this thing? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's an evolving thing. I find that, uh, I mean, I'm particularly sad right now because our drummer, Pat Spurgeon from Rogue Wave, he just moved last week. And quite frankly, he moved because it's too expensive to live in the Bay Area. I mean, it's virtually impossible for people, you know, people to buy homes right now who aren't extraordinarily affluent. So there's been such cultural flight uh, to the Bay Area, which is really tragic. Um, it's really hurt the the community culturally in a lot of ways. And um but for me personally, I have found that uh, it's been a journey. I, I think that I've tried to strike this balance between uh, a few different things, um, trying to help raise money for others, yeah. trying to do things uh, to give away just to, to people that follow our, our band, just purely for fun, for art's sake. And also I've tried to uh, use the different platform if you hear that screaming, that's my son. Um, I tried to use the various platforms that are out there also just to drive some semblance of cottage industry revenue towards our band. Yeah. So I've tried to kind of, and I find that when I do a blend of those things, I feel a little bit better. I feel like I have a little bit more agency over, you know, myself, my art and, and just connecting with people. It's, it's funny, you know, prior to the pandemic, I, I, 
viewed social media and a lot of those platforms, I had kind of a dim view of them. I felt like I used them out of necessity because I kind of felt like I had to, but I didn't really enjoy using them or feel like I had a sincere Mm -hmm. uh, connection with fans. And um, the pandemic actually changed my perception of that and the way I've tried to engage people with, you know, a lot of sincerity and, and being a bit of an open book uh, with no real agenda um, that's helped. And so Mm -hmm. I felt like it's really, uh, there's been a lot more conversation. I've been a lot more active with people and trying to give back as much as I, you know, take in. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, I, you know, if you had a question, I'm happy to answer. But the thing that really got me the most excited about the potential of the community, uh, people that listen to our music and just the greater uh, community is not too far into the pandemic. Um, it, it was looking like things were kind of grim. And, you know, we had done some work with Noise Pop, which is a promotional organization in the Bay Area, which is incredible, which has supported us from the beginning. And we were doing some fundraising with them to just um, drive revenue to local venues, um, which was fun. And, you know, we basically did backyard performing in my in my backyard. So the band was all spread out, you know. Um, and so we, we did that. But I was also trying to think about, well, what could we do personally as a band? And... Um, and I felt like, you know, there's so many causes, there's so much need, you know, where do we even start, you know? And so um, one thing we did was, um, I had noticed at the time there was this hip hop artist named Aesop Rock and he recorded this EP. I don't know if you saw this campaign, but he recorded this song called Rogue Wave. And that kind of tickled me. I'm like, and there was, you know, when he put it out, there's no mention of us. He just kind of put the song and I, I'm like, that's, that's kind of funny. So um, we recorded a song called Aesop Rock, which, I thought it was kind of funny. And, and, but I thought, you know, we want to do this, but I'm like, how can I do something? How can I use this as a vehicle in some way, rather than just putting out some self-serving single? And so I, uh, I got in touch with a, a publicity agency in New York. And I said, you know, I have this new song and I want to do something with it. You know, what, 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 what can we do? And, and then I started just reaching out to nonprofits uh, I talked to Oxfam. I talked to a lot of national, international organizations. Like this is, I'm just a guy in a band with a song, want to help somehow. What can I do? And then I, you know, I talked to guys in the band and I decided um, I want to go local, just, you know, go with who you know and where you're from. And, and so I reached out to this group called Tipping Point, which is the barrier based organization. They've been working here for decades, uh, raising money directly to families in need. And I, I just started having meetings with them and going, going on to some of their, you know, conference calls. And uh, one, actually, one of the first ones was, was with Gavin Newsom, which was kind of interesting. Um, and I started working with them. I got the agency involved. And, uh, you know, I got an incredible artist to do all this artwork for it. And we put it out and uh, raised a bunch of money. You know, people really wanted to be involved. And, and I thought to myself, okay, what else can we do here? And I started putting playlists together of my favorite uh, bands in the Bay Area, who are the most significant to me or, you know, legacy artists, new and emerging artists. And I put these playlists together and I started reaching out to bands on social media. I'm like, hey, this is something we're doing. If you're interested, please uh, spread the word. And they did. They really did. And so much money was raised for Tipping Point going directly to families. Um, I mean, there is a self-serving nature to it. I mean, we were getting attention for having a new single, but there's all this revenue being directed towards this group and it, it felt good. Um, and I really kind of pushed it. Um, there's this group called the Lonely Island. You know, they do like comedy. I'm sure you've seen their skits and they do movies and yes. they, put, they put out before the pandemic this, this joke uh, mini uh, film about uh, the, these, these players on the A's and it was this really funny video, music video. And I put that song on our playlist and I just reached out to them like, Hey, you know, and they responded, they donated, they got their fan base to be involved in this tipping. And so these things work together. And what starts as like a joke with Aesop Rock kind of blossomed. And it was just, it was fun. It was engaging. There was great art with it. And it just made me feel like we had some purpose. And I feel like we reached beyond our fan base reached a little farther, but really benefited our own community. So I felt human for a minute. That's so neat, Zach. And, and I think that's part of, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're all living through this in real time. And so it's really hard to be sort of like in the moment and then also like trying to figure out what's happening, like at a different level. But 
you know, I just think back to, you know, you and I first connected, you know, a long time ago around like Pat, your drummer had health issues and <laughs> your band pre Obamacare is doing a lot of work, just helping people understand that, you know, working artists and working musicians can't get health insurance and, you know, the structural yeah. things. And you think about the challenges of communicating a message, any message, you know, mm-hmm. 10, 15 years ago, if you're trying to do community-based advocacy work uh, or messaging work and like where we are now, I mean, it, it is overwhelming and exhausting, just all the noise, but it also just to your point allows us to do things that we, you know, just even things like today's show, like this isn't something we would have thought about doing, you know, on zoom yeah. a couple years ago. So. It, it is incredible. Actually, you bring up that point because there was a documentary made about Pat It's called detour. If anyone wants to see it, uh, the letter D and then tour, I think you can find it on Vimeo. There's a channel, uh, maybe Alex, or I, I can send a note after, but um, it's incredible how relevant, I mean, that mo- that film was made, 13 years ago, I think, and it's still so relevant. And, you know, Michael, you and I have talked about this at great length, but the pandemic is a mirror. It's a mirror uh, in, in so many ways. Take any industry, any aspect of our lives and what uh, our our country was designed for and what it wasn't designed for. Um, and healthcare is, is, you know, obviously, you know, artists, um, you know, like myself and others, you know, Healthcare and access to healthcare, uh, mental health care, it's very hard to come by. And Pat, uh, you know, and for those of you who don't know, Pat was uh, born with a, a failing kidney. He, and when our band really kind of started getting going, we're really touring on the road, he, uh, his kidney, his second kidney um, failed. And so he was doing dialysis while we were on tour and peritoneal dialysis, which allows you to do it, you know, on the go. And the film documents our kind of struggles to try, because when you do dialysis, it has to be in a very kind of sterile environment. And for anyone who's been on tour before, not very sterile. So, um, and then the film dovetails in a lot of other issues. Um, One of our band members uh, died during the, the, you know, the making of the film and, you know, his organs were, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredible movie, but it does, it goes back to the point that you're absolutely right. Oh, thank you, Alex, for putting that in there. Um, it's a great movie. And it really kind of shows how we don't place a lot of value. We may place a lot of value uh, intrinsically on, you know, how much we like art and artists, but in terms of the protection they need, and it really has left Pat and a lot of other people like him who have pre-existing conditions through no follow their own with very little ability. You know, if if you need anti-rejection medication, you're a musician, you're really stuck in this limbo in which if you receive a certain amount of money through any kind of work, then you don't have any protection anymore. And he's been in this limbo ever since. And, um, you know, it's tough, challenging. Well, and, and, you know, it makes me think, I mean, one of the reasons we want to have you on this week is, and, and I'm going to ask you sort of an impossible question because it's very open-ended. So I apologize, you know, in, in advance, but again, this notion of, of what I said before that, you know, as people have been thinking about music and the structures of the music community and policy and how to reform for a long time. And, and it's, it, you know, one of the things that happened in the past year is this sort of explosion of advocacy and organizing and, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, self-advocacy in a way that we, we've never seen before. And so you have NEVA, you have NEDO, you know, on the talent organization side, you you have, you know, be an arts hero, you have, you know, the folks that we, we showcased last week in terms of, you know, the cultural advocacy group and, and people either have been in the sector for a long time or people who are brand new to the sector, all sort of embracing, you know, what is kind of a hackneyed cliche, but this whole notion of, you know, build back better, right? I mean, it's kind of a silly slogan, but it also is sort of a challenge you know, not only to our country about everything we do in this country, but about our industry herself. And I just wonder if you have any reflection as someone who's been in the community, someone who's been community minded for a long time. I mean, you've always been sort of engaged in, in, in that intersection of music and social justice and nonprofit support. And also thinking about like, what, is, what does it mean to you to see the sort of explosion of, of self-advocacy and, and organizing efforts? Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, and I, I've talked to you about this before, when you see the contrast between our country and other countries in terms of how they value uh, through policy um, art and how it's funded. And, and, uh, and it is striking, you know, on the indie rock level, you know, 
opening bands have been making the same amount of money for 25 years. <laughs> Things have not changed very much. And so when I see, and also, and it, we haven't been that well organized. And when I see what Neva has accomplished, uh, that level of, of um, taking action, being organized, the communication, and being able to kind of galvanize um, a lot of these venues together that have been pretty disparately disassociated from one another, um, it gives me a lot of encouragement. Yeah. And just, you know, on just on the purely, and I know I've been talking about local stuff here, but what I've seen is, you know, when these groups organize effectively, when they make enough noise, you do see some change. I mean, there was legislation that was proposed in December, maybe it was late November, December, to kind of help local venues because there was, no one knew it was going to happen in the election. And there was, you know, it, you know, there was a lot of speculation, but there wasn't a lot of awareness about um, what the next uh, round of funding was going to be in most small venues are kind of left in the lurch. And so we saw something pass. I think it was yesterday, the day before it actually went through, there's some rescue funding in San Francisco. And is it going to be a, a, is there a totality to its level of bridge funding to really rescue all venues? No, it's limited, but I think we got there because a lot of venues we're making noise. You know, what I've learned through revs and what we, we find, and I think if we prove the point that venues don't just have this existential benefit to people because music is great. We know that it's great. But when we also present a case that without these venues, you know, these venues anchor these economic communities. And so when we present the case in that way and make a lot of noise unapologetically, I think we find ourselves in a better position. And um, like I said before, it is a mirror. When we see these venues closing, it's, it's shocking. Yeah. It's shocking because we always thought they'd be there, even though they've been so, so demeaned. And the venues that don't own their own buildings that are paying rent, you know, they're in a really difficult situation, obviously. And, and we have to fight for that funding. Yeah. Well, Zach, we always love hearing from you. Um, February 17th, the next all request show. That's right. And that's check that out. Yeah, away. I'm doing an all request. Yeah, I've been using this uh, platform called Moment House. They're kind of a new streaming platform, uh, but it's, it's great. You know, artists can kind of, they get to keep all the contacts and people submit their email, but it's, it's been a great channel for me. I keep the ticket price low and it's, it's fun. It's, it's like a weekly or bi-weekly get together and um, it's, it's a good time. Cottage awesome. industry. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All righty, Zach, it's always great to see you. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the work you're doing on revs and, and everything else. So we'll talk soon. Yeah.